And when I get to New England, the only thing I knew about the game of football was playing left tackle. And Bill's like, hey, you're going to be a great right tackle. We're going to, you know, I mean, look, I mean, neighbors, I mean, we're going we're gonna to put you a right tackle. I mean, you know, look. I'm not sure if that's exactly how it went, but it was something like that. Regarding your own career, you came out of Purdue. I guess they auditioned you a little bit on the right side of the offensive line. You found your home at left tackle eventually. What did you learn? What did you have to experience before you could settle in and ultimately be the protector for 11 years, the blind side of the greatest quarterback in NFL history? Yeah, at the time, he was driving a yellow Jeep that was given to him by a dealership somewhere in the suburbs, OK? <laughs> And for the record, Bill was the one who came up with the idea to put me at right tackle. All right, so I came into Purdue as a tight end. And the only reason they did that is because the only film they saw of this idiot kid from middle of nowhere was when I lined up at tight end because my quarterback was my childhood friend. We were thick as thieves, and I was supposed to be on the offensive line, but I ran a route, and he threw me the ball. My coach hated me for the rest of my career in high school. <laughs> And somehow they saw that tape. And uh, so, but I finally, you know, matriculated back to where I was supposed to be all along. And when I get to New England, the only thing I knew about the game of football was playing left tackle. And Bill's like, hey, you're going to be a great right tackle. We're going to, you know, I mean, look, I mean, neighbors, I mean, we're going we're gonna to put you a right tackle. I mean, you know, look. I'm not sure if that's exactly how it went, but it was something like that. And, uh, I was terrible. I was the worst right tackle. I mean, that literally would be like, all right, kid, um, you know, you're, you're batting. You're an awesome guy. I know you've never swung it left-handed. You ever try to throw a ball left-handed? You ever done anything with your other non-dominant hand? That's what it's like if you're going to go from left tackle to right tackle. And it was atrocious. And then I finally settled in, and, man, that was an awesome experience um, because I, I got hurt playing right tackle in training camp, and then I... <laughs> My, the first time I put pads on in uh, about three weeks was when we lined up against Cincinnati. And we all know how that went in 2001. You know, nothing like losing to a powerhouse on a season opener in their stadium. Awesome experience. And then from there, it, just, it, was, it was just learning. It was trying to figure out how do you be a left tackle in the National Football League and keep up with the demands and everything else and awesome times. Here we are on 9-11. And of course, you were a patriot in that week of September when the terrorist attack, the World Trade Center, plane crashed into the Pentagon, and of course in the field in Pennsylvania. You had a teammate on your offensive line with whom you were very close to, Joanne Druzy, whose brothers were among New York's bravest. And that experience, reflecting today, 18 years later, take us back to what it was like the morning of September 11th, and what it was like in the aftermath as well for you and your teammates, especially with someone and we were all touched by it, all affected by it, but here you had Joe on your team, and his brothers, of course, became symbols of the strength and the collective response to those attacks. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. You, you, there, there are certain things that define your life. There's certain things that define moments. Um, you know, when you're little, it smells, and it's, you know, the, the idea of, you know, kind of being around greatness, and then as you get older, you get caught up in life and you get into these modes where I don't know what I did yesterday and I can't remember how I defined things. And then a moment like 9-11 happens and I was sitting in what was the old Foxborough Stadium and uh, the area that I was at was what we referred to as the dungeon. There were rats that walked through on a regular basis. You can't make it up. It was the worst environment. I went from the Big Ten to the bottom 10, and I'll never forget, there was, <laughs> there was one TV that Bill allowed to be in the training room, because it, it, it was a Monday. It was a Monday or it was a Tuesday? Tuesday. I think it was a Tuesday. Tuesday morning, yeah. It was, because it, it was our supposed day off, because we don't have days off, and uh, I'll just never forget it, because there, there weren't a lot of people in the training room at the time. And there was one TV, I think a player had to buy it, and Bill allowed it to be in the training room. And that one TV broke to the tower that got hit first. And I remember that it was just this, this awkward 
strange feeling that everybody had. And of course, we all experience that in different ways. But I think that to your point, you know, Joe Andrusi and his family and, and that up close and personal moment. There, there are people here in Boston, you know, due to, you know, the relationships and, and, the, and the closeness between, you know, the Boston and the New York markets that that I met and that I knew. But to see Joe and how he dealt with that and his brothers and his family, it it made that season something bigger than any of us could have ever imagined. As players, especially in a Belichick system, you don't think about things in the real world. You know, he tells you there's a drawer in your office and you open that thing up and during the months of basically July to hopefully February, anything that comes at you that's not football related, you put it in that drawer. And so, you know, you're constantly opening this drawer and throwing stuff in it that's not football related. But I think that was the one time where, as an organization, as a team, as individuals, we all kind of stopped. And because of the Andrusi effect, we understood, you know, just how fragile things are. And so I think you look back on it now after all these years and, you know, you, you try to put that in perspective and how that looks today. And I think that, you know, that was one moment where we all said, you know what, life's a lot bigger than what we kind of thought. Uh, but it's 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 amazing to remember those things because those things are definable moments that everybody can learn from. And if you forget those lessons, if you if you forget about what a Joe Andrusi family went through, or your neighbor, or a cousin, or a friend, or somebody else, you're missing the boat. You know, no matter how many championships you get, those are the things that define things. For so many of us, outside of professional athletes, the so-called return to normalcy. How many, how many times do we hear that? in the next week or two, a return to normalcy, for me meant listening to a baseball game midweek the, when baseball resumed in the major leagues and watching football that first Sunday. And so you guys reconvene. Uh, Joe's brothers are there for the opening coin toss. They're honored at midfield. Uh, things don't go well for a couple of weeks. Drew gets hurt against the Jets. But then you guys find your way, and you become the darlings of the National Football League. And, ultimately capture Super Bowl 36. We are all ch uh, patriots, of course, the famous line uh, by Robert Kraft after that championship in the wake of 9-11. Principles of leadership and resilience, how important were those in the weeks that followed, not just 9-11 and what we went through as a country collectively, but what you guys went through a team, a lot of young guys, a lot of new guys of whom not much was expected. You lose your star quarterback. And you've got to rally around a young kid who was the fourth string quarterback only a year earlier. Yeah, what, what a wild year in its entirety. Um, 2001 for me as a rookie, you know, look, I'd, I had this coach that had a way with words. Let's just put it that way. His name's Dante Scarnecchia. He's part Italian, uh, part Mexican, which is the worst combination. <laughs> that you could ever have. I'm not, I, I'm not just saying that. Like, that should not be allowed. You know, and, and what, <laughs> yes. my, my kids are half Italian and half Latin, but that's okay, go ahead. <laughs> so you know. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but you might have a point there. <laughs> but you know, he, he, would, he would remind me, like, you don't know if the ball's pumped or stuffed. Right, like you know nothing, you have no idea what's going on. Um, keep your head down, kid. Keep working. Keep doing what you do. And I, I kind of rather enjoyed that. Right. I mean, now I played with some guys that weren't necessarily on that same page. They didn't look at things that way. They didn't last very long either. Um, but in a Belichick system, you truly either get in where you fit in, or you're out. And you know, I don't think that that was the norm. I mean, if it was the norm, then by 2019, there should be somebody else that has caught on to how you coach a whole bunch of guys that are very strongly opinionated, that have big egos, and there's a lot of them, right? I mean, these other sports, you, yeah, you got to tame like four or five of them, maybe seven. But in football, it's a whole different realm. And that organized, systematic approach to every single day, do your job, work hard, be attentive, put the team first, manage expectations, don't fuel the hype, ignore the noise, and speak for yourself. Those are the tenets of the Patriot way. Now, I can say those very fluidly because for 11 years, that was on the door going in and out of the stadium. That's not by chance, okay? Um, 
But that 2001 season, for me, soaking all that in, you know, 9-11, a, a, new, a new quarterback. We lost our quarterback coach before the season ever started. Adversity was just the name of the game. And how you overcome that was lived out in everything that we did. It was in living color. Like, it was right there. It was very vivid. So, you know, look, trial under fire, I respond a lot better when it was supposed to be done two minutes ago than I would if it was done two weeks from now. And I think that, you know, my mentality and how Bill coached and how that staff approached things, it was great. Um, and so I learned a lot, you know, in terms of leadership and what it takes and perseverance and hard work. And, you know, I'm very grateful for 01. Um, didn't work out so well in 02, but we figured it out in 03 and 04. So. You had to deal with something that, uh, I don't think any of us could imagine what it must have been like uh, in any business, in any endeavor, profession, let alone as a professional football player in the trenches, diagnosed with Crohn's disease. That was a good one. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I knew something was, was going on. Um, I, I would say this about the Crohn's disease, right? Um, we're never given more than we can handle in life. Um, whether you have faith or not, you know, it's it's one of those things where you got to do what you got to do anyway, right? And I remember thinking to myself, like, wow, like, every, nobody else has to deal with what I got to deal with. Um, but, but it made me appreciate what I did have. And I think that the reason that was important for me is because it's easy to kind of cry, you know, at times, you know, and, oh, woe is me, and oh, I got to deal with this, and I got to deal with that. And then you go through something real, and... You know, not that I didn't have other challenges in life, but you go through something real and you're like, holy smokes, when I am good, <laughs> it's, I got I to I gotta relish in that. So, you know, in a way, I think that, you know, the Crohn's side of it, which was difficult. I mean, if you know anybody that has that, it's, it's different for everybody. It's, you know, hard to kind of, you know, not get in a rut. But it, it pushed me in ways that, you know, maybe I wouldn't have got to 11 seasons and maybe I wouldn't have, you know, really soaked in the, the highlights and the moments. And, and with that said, you know, look, they took 19 inches of my intestine out. I missed the – what really pissed me off is that I missed one of the best parties of the year, and that was the Super Bowl party. And, and it was in 2004. We won in, you know, the 03 04 season. Kraft has this awesome party. There's great food, free drinks. I'm in, right? Big deal. And my wife had to bring me my ring while I'm sitting in the hospital. I'm like, that's – that sucks. That was terrible. Um, other than that, you know, there's a lot of good coaching lessons in dealing with that. And I would say, um, you know, there's, there's just, there's just so much of what people have to deal with in the real world that if you don't stop and think about those things every now and then, again, I think it's those defining moments, what make you who you are. And in a weird way, I kind of, kind of, dig having Crohn's. It's about 13 months now since you went into the Hall of Fame, the greatest sports dynasty, I believe, in professional sports history. And you're a guy that went into the Hall of Fame in front of Richard Seymour, Rodney Harrison, Mike Vrabel, some of the other great names in those dynastic years. How much does it mean to you today sitting here? Well, it's one of those moments. Look, I, I, I'm not a big fan of awards. I think uh, you know, being a part of a, an organization that had the success that we had, it, it doesn't I don't know how you could scream that it's more important than an individual more than what we represented, right? I mean, I always remember one of the things that I, I thought was incredible was the first time that I heard about the MVP award. You look at any major sports program, maybe you guys have heard this before, maybe you haven't, but it's very notable, especially if you have kids. Um, whoever the most valuable player is, they never win championships. They never win them. I don't care what sport it is, they never win them. So, of course, yes, the team is really important. Even when you look at it through the eyes of the greatest players recognized season in and season out. And when I think about my time in New England and the people that I got to meet and the experiences that I had, and, you know, when you play with a guy like Junior Seau, God rest his soul, when you – or with a Mike Vrabel, or if you spend time around a Kevin Falk and a Troy Brown, and you got a guy like Anthony Pleasant, who maybe nobody in this room knows, maybe everybody does, and if you don't, you should learn about him. These guys were unbelievable leaders, right? And they were just guys that, 
um, define what it means to be a patriot. And so to be recognized as one of the guys that, you know, for whatever reason, you know, you make it to that level of, you know, the Hall of Fame. It's the first time I've worn this jacket since the day that I, I received it. Um, it it's, it's absolutely incredible, but I would say that I hope that what it really speaks to is the organization and the guys behind it because it's never about those individuals. Those guys that I shared that stage with that day that represent the people that are in the hall and the, and the, and the coaches and everybody that makes that up, they would, I think that's the, that's the one thing you'll hear when you're sitting in those circles from them too. It, it, it is so cool because it gives us the platform to talk about all these other guys and what, what the game's really about.